my pleasure today to introduce Phil Levis. Phil's a faculty member at Stanford University in computer science and electrical engineering. And he does a variety of work on wireless systems, ranging from the software all the way down to the hardware. Phil got his doctorate from uh, Berkeley, where he worked with David Culler to pioneer sensor networks, working on the, the Moat platform and the tiny OS operating system. Today, he's going to talk to us about what's become a, a hot topic in, um, in wireless systems, namely full duplex communication. So take it away, Phil. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, first, I'm giving a talk, but I'd like to stress that this is, of course, the work of many people listed at the bottom. In fact, this idea uh, came from a group of students, uh, Mayank, uh, Jungyeol, and Kanan, who locked me out of the lab for three days and then suddenly showed me what they could do. And so really, the credit uh, should go to them. And I just sort of fly around the country and, and tell everyone what they did, because uh, that's my job as a faculty member. But thank you so much for, for coming today. So what's the big deal? So here's an interview with Chuck Thacker. He won the Turing Award uh, last year, in part for his, you know, his pioneer, pioneering work on the Alto. Uh, and one of the things they did as part of Alto was develop Ethernet, which we love so much today. And so they asked him, hey, so tell us about how you're involved in inventing Ethernet. And he says, well, we started from Aloha. This is the packet network developed uh, in Hawaii. And he's saying, you know, the problem which we found with these radios was that when it started, when a radio starts to transmit, it can't receive anything. And that's different, as some of you might know, from wired Ethernet, where you can, in fact, receive while you're transmitting, or at least detect someone else's transmitting. And that's how you react to collisions on the wire. So this is just this basic idea that a radio cannot receive and transmit simultaneously. In fact, you open a wireless textbook today. Uh, here's a textbook by one of my uh, very esteemed colleagues, Andrea Goldsmith, Wireless Communications. And it says, it's generally not possible for a radio to receive and transmit on the same frequency band simultaneously because of the self-interference, because of the interference that results. Instead, radios either alternate, receive and transmit, time division, or they receive and transmit on different frequencies. So you receive on one frequency, you transmit on another. That's what many cell phones do today. But you cannot receive and transmit simultaneously on the same frequency. But it turns out you can. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, the basic summary is you can build a radio that receives and transmits simultaneously. You can build a full duplex radio. This breaks a fundamental assumption about how we've thought wireless networks work. And that turns out to be pretty exciting. Um, you know, it doesn't work for everything. I can't build you a, a full duplex uh, 10 megawatt transmitter. But we've gotten it to work for systems as powerful and wideband as Wi-Fi. And I'll talk about some of the challenges you encounter. So most of this talk is going to be about this first bullet, sort of the technical details of how full duplex works. Um, then I'm going to spend a little time talking about why this is a big deal. What are some ways which this could really change wireless communications? And I'd like to temper that by saying that could change. Right? I think there's a lot of potential here, but this is not you know, going to solve world hunger. And it could be, in the end, that in many places it's too hard to make it work. But we've got to figure out whether that's the case. Finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about what are the things that, going forward, could be barriers or challenges towards the adoption of full duplex widely in wireless systems. So let's start at the beginning. Why is it that radios can't receive and transmit simultaneously? Uh, the answer is self-interference. So your own transmission, because your transmit antenna is so close to your receive antenna, is going to be millions or billions, think 60 to 90 dB, stronger than anything you hear. It's sort of like trying to hear someone whispering to you from across the room while you yourself are shouting. You just can't. Uh, the signal strength of that shout is so strong that you can't possibly hear the whisper. And so the basic problem of being able to receive and transmit simultaneously, of doing full duplex, boils down to some way if I could subtract, and I put in quotes, our own transmission from the signal we hear on our receive antenna. If we could somehow subtract this big red signal, then we could hear the green. We could hear this distant whisper. So a lot of people have tried to do this using different techniques, um, sort of historically. Uh, so in the wireless community for the past five or six years, folks have tried to do this in the digital doma domain. So you convert these analog waveforms to digital samples. Then you just subtract the digital samples. Um, so some prior papers, something like zigzag, the zigzag decoding, analog network coding, do this. They take analog waveforms, reduce them to digital samples, subtract in the digital domain. 
Uh, you can also, there are some little hardware uh, cancellation circuits that'll do something like this. Like when you use noise canceling headphones, that's exactly what they're doing. They're subtracting the external noise of, say, an airplane from the audio signal, so then what you hear sounds like it doesn't have that noise. But in practice, they're not sufficient. So when we're converting to digital samples, we're converting to a set of discrete steps. And we only have so many, like say 10 bits or 12 bits. And if the difference between our own transmission and the transmission we want to receive is greater than that range, if we subtract out the big thing, all we get is zero. You don't get what we want to receive. Um, and so in practice, if you actually employ these techniques, you can get about 40 dB, so a 10,000-fold reduction of your own uh, transmission. And that's not enough to do full duplex. To do full duplex, you need something like 70 to 90 dB. So these things don't work. So I'm going to walk you through two ways to do this, two designs. Uh, the first was published in Mobicom last year. The second was published in Mobicom this year. Um, and I sort, of, I sort of said in the abstract, there's, turns out what makes this really compelling is that there's nothing super complicated here. If you just understand sine waves, uh, this should, you should get it. So the first approach uh, uses something called antenna cancellation. And it's pretty simple. We have two transmit antennas and one receive antenna in the middle. We space the transmit antennas away from distance d and d plus half the wavelength. And now what happens when you do this is suddenly these two transmit signals, because they're offset by half the wavelength, they have a phase offset, they cancel at the receive antenna. You get a null position where the receive antenna hears a much, much weaker signal. And in practice, you can get about a 30 dB reduction doing this. And so if you add digital cancellation, if you add some hardware cancellation techniques, 30 plus 40, you get about 70 dB. And so you can build a full duplex radio. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think that the orientation towards the intended receiver would matter? Is that a problem or not? The orient so these are omnidirectional antennas, and so you're concerned about then these two signals interfering if, if with the, the orbital? offset was four and a half relative to the intended receiver, why don't you get the same cancellation? Ah, so um, the answer is that these two transit signals, because they're offset in distance, aren't at the same transmit power. If they were at the same transit power, then you'd see these nulls everywhere, right. but they're actually at very significantly different transmit powers. And so I can, at the end, I can show you some slides. What this means is that in the far field, you do get some slight reductions in signal strength, but you don't get deep nulls like this. Yeah, great, great question. And what about <clears throat> matching between the two TX antennas relative to the RX antenna? Matching the part, so you have to, you have to tune it. Yeah, you, you have to tune it. Yeah. Oh, so the question is, how about matching? So we want to match the, the amplitude of these two waves. How do you do that? So in this first design, we did it all manually. There's no automatic algorithm. The second design I'll talk about will show about how you do this automatically, how you adjust the amplitudes so they match at the receive antenna. OK. Um, and so in practice, what this means is you stick these three techniques together, and you get 70 dB, and that means that you get full duplex. And what's kind of exciting about this is there's not, this actually turns out to not be super difficult, at least from an you know, electrical engineering grad student standpoint, where literally, we're talking about a wooden board with three holes drilled in it and antennas put in those holes. I got to drill the holes in the board. You know, they did everything else. Um, and so this is the setup. This is a full duplex radio. See, there's, you know, the, we've got the digital cancellation. It's a USRP. Uh, we've got the hardware cancellation circuit. And then these three antennas in a board. And that's it. You have a full duplex radio. And so bringing it together, what you see is first, the first step is that you have this cancellation in the analog domain, the antennas, reducing the signal strength observed at the receive antenna. Then you have a hardware cancellation circuit. This thing is called the QHX220, um, which is what some prior approaches have used. And we just used that here, uh, which again is still operating in the RF domain. Then you take those analog samples, sample the one with an analog digital converter, convert them to digital values, which then you can process in software. Um, on the radio or in hardware if you're building uh, an actual chip to do this. And then what you get are clean RX samples. So let's look at this antenna cancellation. This is kind of the big deal. This is the step forward. So here's the setup. On the x-axis is the position of a receive antenna. And the y-axis shows the signal strength that that receive antenna observes. And so you can see. When the TX1 antenna is transmitting, as we move the receive antenna away, the signal strength goes down. 
Similarly, if the TX2 antenna is transmitting, as we move the RX antenna away, its signal strength goes down. And this gets back to Ed's question about the variable signal strength. You'll see that TX2 has a higher maximum strength because we're placing the receive antenna further away from it. So it actually transmits at a slightly higher power than TX1. And where those two powers cross, you get a deep null, where those two signals are canceling each other. And now suddenly we have this null position where if we put the receive antenna there, suddenly what we hear is much, much quieter. We can subtract it out, and we can, commun we can transmit while we receive. This is about 25 to 30 dB. Great, so it works, right? We have a null position, it's silent, right? We do full duplex, you know, game over. Uh, unfortunately, it's not that simple. There are some limitations to this technique. There's some fundamental limitations. Um, in particular, how well can we match the amplitude of these two transmit signals? If they're matched perfectly, hey, we can have perfect cancellation, right? They exact an exact match. Um, and so depending on the mismatch between the two transmitted, observed transmitted signals, there's a maximum bound of what you can cancel, right? So for example, if we are off by about half a dB, we can cancel at most about uh, you know, 30, 30 dB. There's also a question as to how well we place these antennas, right? If we put the receive antenna in the wrong spot, they're not going to cancel as well. And so as depending on the placement error for the RX antenna, um, there's a limitation as to how well we can cancel. I really don't have a question. Yeah, suppose your frequency hopping. Over what range can your frequency hop without deteriorating? Great question. So the question is, what if you're frequency hopping? What if you're not operating a single frequency? I'm gonna, I'll get to that question, right? Because it turns out there's actually a bigger problem in this relating exactly to that. Um, and so what this means in practice, if we want to cancel 30 dB, we need about a 0.5 dB amplitude uh, you know, accuracy, 5%. And we need the antenna to be placed correctly within about a millimeter. So again, you can drill a hole in a wooden board and this will work. Great, so hey, maybe we're done, but no. Um, if we want something for higher power, we need to do better than that. But there's actually a bigger problem. Uh, that, hey, there are these limits, they're actually really low. This gets back to Ed's question, which is that, remember I said D, D plus half the wavelength. Well, real wireless signals aren't a signal frequency. They have a bandwidth, like an 802.11, channel is 20 megahertz to 40 megahertz wide. And 802.15.4 channel, which is what this first design was for, is 5 megahertz wide. And so what this means is that you can place the receive antenna perfectly for the center frequency, but for the two side frequencies, it's going to be a little too short or a little too far. Right? You can, it's sort of like you're hearing a chord of different notes, and you can cancel one of those notes perfectly, but you can't cancel all of them simultaneously because they all have different frequencies. And so the phase you'd want, the phase offset you'd want is different. And so what this means is that just Wi-Fi itself, because it's in the 2.4 gigahertz band, uh, it's at 20 megahertz wide channels, basically relates to even if you place the receiver antenna perfectly at the center frequency, the fact of the bandwidth gives you a placement error of 0.26 millimeters, which turns out to be a problem. It basically means you can't quite do Wi-Fi in this technique. And so you can, in fact, plot just analytically, given the bandwidth of the signal, given the frequency uh, the center, so the frequency band that you're in, what's the best that you can do? And so for something like the 2.4 gigahertz band, right, for something like Wi-Fi, the best we could possibly do is 47 dB, which turns out to not quite be enough. So we can do lower power wireless, like 802.15.4, that's down 5 megahertz wide and transmits at basically 23 dB lower than Wi-Fi. But we can't quite do Wi-Fi with this technique. But so we evaluated this with 802.15.4. Uh, it's sort of personal area network, home area network uh, type stuff. And yeah, built a radio, a pair of radios that can receive and transmit simultaneously. Um, I didn't want to bring the big kit and stuff to show you the demo. Uh, it's kind of, it's a lot to haul. Uh, we demoed this in Mobicom last year, and you know, it's a nice thing. You can see the nodes transmitting and receiving concurrently. And so from a high level, what this does, wireless, is it doubles your throughput. Right? I can transmit and receive simultaneously on a single frequency, single bandwidth. 
And using the prototype, that's about what we saw. We saw about an 84% improvement, because again, this is a research prototype. You know, our RF engineering isn't, isn't something someone spent years on. Um, and so that's basically just with something with you know, boards uh, within 92% of ideal full duplex. So it's at 184% for within 92% of what you'd expect. With just a simple, simple design. It's kind of, kind of impressive what those guys did. So, and there are some issues with the software radios, the digital stuff where they have some issues at low SNR. But this is a product of those platforms we're using rather than the actual underlying principle. Great, so that's design one. Three antennas, phase offset, lots of fun. Um, but, you know, it, it has a bunch of limitations. The first is that we need three antennas. Uh, that's kind of a pain. I don't really want to use three antennas. It's limited to this low power, narrow band wireless, 802.15.4, you know, one milliwatt, five megahertz watt. Third limitation, it has these things that Ed sort of asked about, these far field effects, where, hey, because we have these two transmit antennas, they kind of interfere a little bit with each other in the far field, so you can have some weird things with some quiet spots and some louder spots. The last thing, this is all manually tuned. You know, we tweak some little things, some knobs, and we can get it to work. Actually getting a radio to adapt to real world conditions dynamically is an open problem. So there are these limitations of this first design. So if we take a step back, so remember, the thing that we're trying to do here is we're trying to subtract our own transmission from what we're hearing. Basically, subtract the red from what we hear so that we can recover the green. Right? This notion of subtraction. But if we go back, because we're doing this thing with phase offset, it's sort of a poor man's subtraction. We're not actually subtracting the signal. What we're kind of doing is taking two slightly different copies of the signal, which aren't exactly the same because of the signal bandwidth, and hoping they mostly sort of subtract, but they don't. And that's what these curves show. We aren't actually subtracting the signal. We're kind of adding a slightly different, but mostly similar signal. And that's what leads to this fundamental limit. They kind of show this a little pictorially, right? When you're doing cancellation with phase offset, when you match the phases exactly, that is, you're operating on that frequency and the phase offset of the cancellation signal is offset properly, when you're trying to do that same offset with a slightly different frequency, you still get some signal out because it's not exact, exactly the right phase offset. And so that's frequency dependent and narrow band. Now, if there's some way we could take the signal and actually invert it, rather than offset, just like take that signal and make a negative of it, and then make the phases the same, right? Make the delay the same, so the two arrive at the same time rather than one offset in time, they'll match exactly for all frequencies. So the question is, how do you invert a signal? In, in you know, the computer science, in bits, that's easy, right? Take the negative. In analog, not, it's, a little, it's a little more complicated, but the point here is that if we could actually invert the signal, we can be frequency and bandwidth independent. Doesn't matter what frequency you're at or the bandwidth. So how do you do that? So it turns out there's this nice little circuit called a balanced, unbalanced uh, transformer or converter or Balin. And you put a positive signal up on the top left, x sub t. And what comes out on the other side is minus x sub t divided by 2 and x sub t divided by 2. So you put in the signal and you get that signal and it's inverse, a negative copy of it. Great. This has been used for a while in things like phones, all kinds of other uh, communication systems. And so just to show you what this second design looks like, we take a traditional radio design. Right? You've got a transmit antenna and a receive antenna. And the problem is that what the RX front end is getting is the sum of those two signals. So you add a bail-in to invert the signal. You then basically just subtract. Uh, you basically add that Balin signal with what you're receiving to then be subtracting the signal from itself. You add a device that essentially is going to adjust the delay of that negative signal and the power of that negative signal to try to match what it is that you're, you're hearing of your own self-interference. So this attenuator is variable attenuator and delay line. 
And so this variable attenuator and delay line is adding some factor of, of phase and amplitude. And it turns out that the signal that travels over space from the transit to the receive antenna has some delay, has some amplitude loss. Let's just call that A. Now this attenuator and delay line is also going to have some delay and it has some amplitude loss. Let's call that V. What you're going to hear is what you want to hear, R, plus that AT minus VT. Is this new? Uh, so I think as a general RF design or as a general circuit design, no. Right? In the sense that this has been done in places before, like you know, think your wired telephones in the past. But people haven't done it in radios. And you can ask me why, and I'll say, I don't know. Right? Have they done it in radios? Oh, oh yes. <laughs> oh, yes? This has been something people have been looking at for the last 15 years. I mean, cancellation through the, through the RX path. Anyway, I'll, Okay. Keep going. I'm kind of curious about some other things. Okay, sure. I'm sorry. And the basic point is that if you match V and A, then suddenly <coughs> you can hear R. So does this actually work? So uh, we set up uh, two circuits, right? One where we have this signal inversion cancellation setup, so we do the bail-in, uh, and then we're just, rather than actually having a transit path, we're just summing the two sides of the bail-in. Um, and then we're doing a phase offset cancellation setup where we add that delay, that lambda over 2 delay. Could you uh, go one step back? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So here you don't receive AT, you receive AT and a phase because you have multipath. So the question here is, here you don't receive AT, you're actually receiving much more than AT because there can be multipath effects. It's not just that the signal is taking one path from the transit to the receive antenna. It could be taking multiple paths. So I'll talk about that later. So it's clear. This is going to work if you just have one cancellation circuit. It's going to work for one component, probably the line of sight component. You might want to have additional, additional cancellation circuits for other components. Or depending on their amplitude, you might be able to do them in the digital domain. Right? So that's absolutely an open question. It's like, what are, how many components are there in the receive signal? How are you going to subtract them out? Great. Um, and so these are purely wired experiments we did here. But this is just to look at this question of the frequency selectivity of these approaches. Right? I claim that by using this Balin approach that we can do something that is not narrowband, that it can work at arbitrary frequencies, it can work at uh, arbitrary power. Um, and theoretically, that's true. Uh, but of course, in practice, it's not. Uh, circuits are not math. There's all these practical things that come into play. And so what these two plots show you is the left is essentially the received signal we see at the receiver, uh, this for you know, a 240 uh, megahertz chirp um, over frequency for using the signal inversion approach using a bail-in versus the phase offset approach using these two uh, signals offset and phase. And so on the left, lower is better. And the point here is that phase offset does get a great deal of cancellation, but that cancellation is this very narrow notch because it's only canceling one frequency. In contrast, the Balin approach by inverting can actually cancel about 20, its, it's sort of trough is about 20 megahertz wide. And you know, if you had a better Balin, you can maybe do better. But that's what we can get with sort of a commodity part you know, ordered from, uh, from DigiKey or something. And the effect of that is on the right, is you look at the bandwidth of the signal in megahertz, and then what's the cancellation that we can do is that, sure, for, for singles, signals that are a single frequency, phase offset is just as good, right? There's no issue with the bandwidth. But as you increase the bandwidth, phase offset gets worse and worse and worse. And signal inversion, even in this working circuit, uh, still performs much better. So we can get you know, 50 uh, dB cancellation for something really narrow band for like a 5 megahertz signal. And even for something that's 20 megahertz wide, we can get about 50 dB of cancellation, 50 dB. And so what that means is 20 megahertz is about Wi-Fi. And we can do about 50 dB of cancellation, um, which is about 12 dB. So think, you know, that's a lot. Um, better than phase offset. So now this means that, hey, maybe we can build a full duplex wider band, so Wi-Fi device. Um, the other thing which didn't quite say is, hey, I remember I said there were three antennas. Well, guess what? Now there's two. Right, one transmit, one receive. So we don't have these far field effects of two transmit antennas causing weird 
signal uh, strengths and weaknesses in the, in the far field. Furthermore, because we're using this attenuator and delay line, if it's programmable, we can have the system dynamically adapt in real time to the changing conditions of the environment. So how would, how would it adapt? How would it adapt? Uh, so the question is, how would it adapt? So I'll, I'll show you in a second. Yeah. So to go back, remember, there's this, there's this problem in this approach, which is we need to match the self-interference power and delay. That is, the negative signal that's coming from the Balin. We want it to match the delay of the positive signal. We want it to match the strength of the positive signal. Um, we can't really do this in the digital domain. We can't be converting digital samples to do this because if we're way off, we're just going to saturate the ADC. So instead, um, what we do is, in the, the system that the students built, just use RSSI, the Received Signal Strength Indicator. And so the idea is that if we've canceled as well as we can cancel, and there's nobody else is transmitting, right? if our cancellation settings are they're optimal, then when we transmit, we will observe the lowest RSSI we can observe. In the sense of, we transmit, listen to see if we hear stuff, adjust some settings, and when we can't adjust them anymore so that things, are, you know, things can't get any quieter, then that's the best settings that we can have. And so, just by observing the signal strength on the channel as we adjust these things, we can apply some feedback to the attenuator um, and delay. Um, and so the objective here is we want to minimize the received power when we're transmitting ourselves, and our control variables are delay and attenuation. Um, and so what's nice about this is it basically just has you know, a global minimum. This isn't a complex form. And so we can do just local optimizations, basically can just walk this gradient until we find that global minimum of transmit power. Um, this is just a simple gradient descent approach can work. Um, and so it turns out the actual approach, to get back to your question, the actual approach we do for this, we use for this is we use an approximation of the, of the delay and attenuation using the QHX220, which is basically has the phase delay offset copy of the signal by half the wavelength, or by a quarter of the wavelength. It's basically doing the quadrature, and then adjust its settings for the gain of the quadrature and the in phase. Um, this is the approximation. But when we have our manual delay and attenuator settings, right, you can just tune this. But to do it programmatically, we use this circuit. And so here's some examples of you know, the settings over time, the steps that the algorithm uses. I'm not going to go into depth about the algorithm, simple gradient descent. Uh, it's in the paper if you'd like to read about it. But the point is that generally what we observed is that it converges to the best settings within eight to five iterations. So it takes about a millisecond using the hardware that we've got, which not fantastic. Right? A millisecond is a long time for some wireless systems, but it's not, uh, it's not terrifying. Um, and so you bring it all together, and it turns out there's a lot of other stuff involved. Again, I'm sort of light over that, like how digital inter uh, interference cancellation works, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the key part here is sort of what's going on in the analog domain. What's going on, at least in the second paper, in the digital domain is sort of well-known techniques, at least commercially, which we just re-implemented, which turns out to be a lot of work. But that's fine. So one question you can ask is that doing this measurement to figure out those optimal settings takes about a millisecond. Well, how often does the channel change? If the channel is changing every five milliseconds, so we have to adjust the settings every five milliseconds, that's not very good. Um, so what we did is we sort of figured out the plot of the channel coherence time of uh, 2.4 gigahertz, so a Wi-Fi node over over time, just seeing what happens to cancellation. So we configure the system to its optimal, and then observe how the cancellation decays over time. And basically, what we see is within about one to two seconds, cancellation degrades. The channel has changed a bit. There's some slightly different uh, multipath or something, a very short multipath. Um, it decays about 3 dB in one to two seconds, and after about 10 seconds, we're seeing a, 10, a 6 dB reduction. And this is a lot. I mean, 6 dB is a lot. 3 dB is a lot. But what that means is that you could say tune every second and still be within 3 dB. So every second, you have to spend a millisecond, and you're within 3 dB of the optimal settings. It's pretty good, pretty promising. 
This is for the stationary angle, right? Because if you move, the yes. Uh, so this is for stationary angle. Yeah. I'm moving. Uh, uh, no question, right? But don't forget that. So the moving is going to change maybe the multipath components around you, but there's still this dominant component, which is, say, between the receive and transmit antennas. And if you sort of think about, sort of by definition, right, the multipath components are going to be much weaker than this dominant line of sight component, right? But you're absolutely right. I mean, there's all kinds of, like, we're talking about some Wi-Fi nodes. You know, they're sitting up there. We're not driving in cars. We're not, you know, running down the streets of New York City. No question. I think mobility is, and how quickly the channel changes, this is for a static network. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so you stick this stuff together, and what do you get? Um, so RF cancellation, we can get about 43, 44 dB. Sometimes we see up to 55 if thing, the day is going really well. Um, but you know, you stick that, add digital cancellation, and if you stick your two Wi-Fi antennas, you're receiving your transmit antennas far enough apart, which I mean 10 centimeters maybe, so four inches, uh, the combined cancellation plus just the attenuation of space between the transmit and the receive antenna means that you can do full duplex Wi-Fi. You can build a full duplex Wi-Fi uh, device. Now, Wi-Fi is operating around 23 dBm, so you know 200 milliwatts. Uh, phones are much stronger than that, so this is not enough to do a full duplex phone. Right? You can't, especially base stations, you can't do that yet. Um, open question as to whether you can. What are the technical limitations? But we can do Wi-Fi, which is in hardening. That's it, right? So you can do full duplex. You can transmit and receive at the same time. You, know, you can cross out that line in the wireless textbook. Um, I like to cause trouble, so I like it when I can, <laughs> I can cross out the line in my, in my colleague's textbook. But um, so what? You can ask this question, so what? You know, can transmit and receive simultaneously? Great. Can't we just divide in time? Can't we just divide in frequency? You know, we've got MIMO, right? We double throughput. Who cares? I have two antennas. Do MIMO. We can double throughput. Um, so what we did is we implemented this second system using the warp platform, um, two radios. Uh, we have OFDM reference. Um, this is just for the experimental setup. We're going to talk about implications. We're doing a 10 megahertz bandwidth, OFDM, CSMA, blah, blah, blah. We modify these setups to do full duplex. We have the control circuits. You can tune them dynamically and all of that. So here's something. So in a Wi-Fi network today, or most ad hoc you know, packet-based networks, um, especially CSMA ones, maybe not with TDMA, with CSMA, uh, there's this problem called a hidden terminal which some of you probably know, some of you might not, so I'll explain it. Uh, so imagine I have an AP, and there are two nodes, N1 and N2. And so the way CSMA works is a node wants to transmit, it listens. If it doesn't hear anything, it assumes the channel is idle, and it transmits. The problem is that it might be idle where it is, but not at the destination. So in this case, both N1 and N2 listen. They hear silence. N1 transmits. N2 is too far away from N1 to hear that, so it transmits as well. The AP, however, is in the middle. It hears both. It hears garbage. The packet is lost. So N1 is a hidden terminal to N2. This is a basic problem in CSMA networks. People have tried to solve this. You know, existed since Aloha. Uh, you know, people have tried to solve this. Lots of approaches. Generally, you know, doesn't work. So full duplex solves this problem. What happens is, is N1 transmits a packet to the AP. And the AP immediately sends data back. It could be dummy, dummy data or it could be real data. It doesn't matter. Now, N2 hears that the AP is transmitting and says, oh, I shouldn't transmit. And so now there isn't a hidden terminal. And since both of them are transmitting at the same time, they don't have hidden terminals to each other. And so implementing this on that, that platform warp, what we saw is experimentally using full duplex. And again, this is you know, a lab set up. A couple, couple grad students over you know, 12 month period played around and figured this out and built it. It reduces hidden terminals by 88%, right? by up to 88%. So think basically you're cutting them tremendously, the, the frequency of their occurrence. They still happen sometimes because it can be that N2 starts transmitting before the AP has figured out the packets for it and it can send a response. So they're not perfect, but tremendous reduction. So uh, another problem 
that you see in Wi-Fi networks today. Um, it's what we call the wireless land fairness. So here's this issue, which is that in something like 802.11, in Wi-Fi, every node is equal. Right? We all back off equally. It's great. It's this quality. Uh, it's a wonderfully democratic society. Unfortunately, a Wi-Fi network is not democratic. The AP is the access point for everyone's traffic in and out of the internet. And so what happens in practice, everyone gets one equal share. If I have a total of n nodes, the downlink throughput from the AP to all of the nodes is one nth of the capacity. And the uplink throughput of each of the nodes to the AP is one nth of the capacity. So suddenly, although we have these sort of links between the nodes and the AP, the AP is only getting one nth of the capacity to get to all of the nodes, because it's the transmitter. Does anyone know how Wi-Fi APs solve this today? Uh, so generally, they kind of cheat a bit. Uh, so they don't back off normally. So normally, you're supposed to exponentially back off when there are losses or whatever, and lots of Wi-Fi APs don't. They just realize we are more important. We are not going to play nice. Um, you know, it actually leads to better behavior, right? It's closer to what you want, but it has certain fairness and other scalability problems. Uh, but with full duplex, right, this goes away. Uh, when I have a packet to send to the AP, AP can send a packet to me. Right? When the AP wants to send a packet to me, I can send a packet back to the AP. And so you can have equal throughput. Right? There's a, one, a throughput downlink of one and an uplink throughput of one. And that uplink throughput is shared across all the transmitting nodes, and the downlink throughput is shared across all of the nodes. So it's this example where even though we're, I, mean, I talked originally about just doubling throughput, it turns out some of the implications of the higher layers, like in this case the link layer, could be bigger and more important. And that's what's really kind of interesting. And so in practice, right, what you see is uh, we have an AP and four stations. There are no hidden terminals here. Um, essentially, when you use half duplex, the upstream throughput is about double what the downstream throughput is. Uh, but when you do use full duplex, it's much closer. Right? So about within, uh, you know, within 20%. Um, and there's a much higher Jane's Fairness Index in terms of the uplink and downlink capacity. And so by distributing the performance, you, gain, you improve fairness in terms of the use of capacity. Yeah? Doing one by one or two by two? Uh, so one by one. Antennas. Antennas? Yeah, so the full duplex, you're going to need two antennas on each station, correct? Mm -hmm. so oh, so you're going to need two by two by Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. So yeah, so that's, again, like, I mean, Clearly, as you can see, right, that wouldn't make sense, right? If we were doing two by two MIMO, we would see much higher, right? So that's the, like, from a raw throughput standpoint, right, I think actually MIMO is, unless you really want bidirectional traffic for latency, like, if you're looking at this from the E, like, link throughput standpoint, MIMO, full duplex, until we can go to one antenna, maybe we can. Not a tremendous win. Right? But I think it's these higher layer of things like, oh, we can actually give you fairness across the wireless line. We can prevent hidden terminals. That's where the benefits come. I'd also argue that, hey, I mean, like, in lots of wireless lands, throughput is not necessarily the big issue. Right? It's things like interference and congestion. Maybe you can do something a little crazier. So today, your phone has tons and tons of radios on it. Um, and you can't operate them all at the same time because they interfere with one another. Um, and so the general approach is that usually you kind of limit how many radios you can operate at once on the phone. Like the phone's not going to let you turn everything on at once because they interfere and they won't work. But would it be possible to maybe add some full duplex circuits? Basically, this, this basic approach of canceling self-interference to uh, enable coexistence. Open question. I don't know. Um, But I think, so the point here going forward is there's examples of maybe where full duplex could be advantageous in access points, like improving fairness. Uh, maybe we can use it in cellular networks. So I have a relay, and it's forwarding what this base station says at the same time the phone is maybe receiving from the relay and the base station at the same time. Can you use something in the physical layer where the combination of these two signals allows it to actually increase its throughput? Um, interesting question. Um, for things like multi-hop networks, can I do cut-through routing in wireless? So I start forwarding a packet before I fully received it because I can be transmitting as I receive and reduce my end-to-end -end latency? Maybe. Um, so there's been a bunch of work recently on how you can use full duplex 
uh, for security, where basically these two nodes transmit to each other, and everyone else hears the, their, their two signals as interference. They hear basically jamming from those two transmitters. And so other people can't snoop on the traffic, or at least it's much harder to snoop on the traffic. Um, so there's been some neat papers recently suggesting, hey, we could use this for security. And maybe in the case it's presented for things like medical devices, but also how about something like fire sheet break? Right? We prevent people from uh, snooping on our, uh, on our cookies and taking our Facebook sessions and stealing our money. And I'll be honest, I don't know, right? This is you know, something like 18, about 18 months, two years of work. And I think the door is just starting to open. And I'll be completely honest. It might be that in the end, like, it all really works for some pretty narrow cases. Or it might be in the end that it actually has a really broad implication that rather than just trying to stick full duplex onto some existing networks to get some improvements, I mean, it's a fundamental assumption that we've had in the design of these networks. And once you break that assumption, who knows what we can do? I'm not sure you know, anyone does yet. And only time will really tell. So full duplex might change the world, right? Or all our wireless might just get better. But it also might not work. So why might it not work? Um, so the first thing here is there's this question. I sort of drew this pretty picture. You know, there's V's and there's A's. And look, if V equals A, we can cancel the signal. But actually getting V to equal A can be very hard. Um, depending on how precisely we can adjust the phase, how precisely we can adjust the attenuation is going to limit how well we can cancel. And it might be that it's not really either possible or feasible that is worth it to build an attenuation delay circuit precise enough and accurate enough to do this. I think there's some hope uh, for a bunch of reasons. In particular, like even if you have something like a current 10 picosecond delay line, variable delay line, that's still pretty good. Uh, probably good enough for Wi-Fi. Um, but what about a 1 picosecond, 0.1 picosecond? Um, sort of a, this is an open question. The other thing which is, in heart, is just sort of a little positive is that it's not exactly important that you have very, very precise delay, very, very precise attenuation. Because as long as you can find that minimum, that minimum point, as long as you have a simple gradient, it should still work. But so it could be that that little box there doesn't go. Yeah. There's also this issue of frequency selectivity. So I showed you 20 megahertz wide. You know, if I want to do something like a phone, I actually have, there's a wider bandwidth than that. And there are sub-channels in it, and they're separated. What kind of frequency independence? What kind of, how wide can we make that? What can we do? It might be that just you need a whole bunch of different circuits, and I don't know. It might be we just can't engineer the components. Yeah? So um, one thing I haven't caught yet is the total amount of cancellation you get. So what, like, what, in this graph, what's the transient power? Uh, oh, so basically, the amount of cancellation we can get if we're like a 10 centimeter separation of the antennas is about 105 dB. Okay. So you can radiate at like 15. Well, we can be able to, you know, when we tune the things as perfectly as possible, these manually like controllable things, we can get like 110, basically just get Wi-Fi, right, at the 23. DBM transmit, given what the noise floor is of the receive circuit. Um, yeah, essentially. So, but it, it all depends on what the transmit power is. So, I mean, the point is, I make the argument: this is possible. That doesn't mean it's practical, right? <laughs> like, it might be. Again, I'll be clear here: like, it could be possible. We can't engineer these systems to really be practical, but like. The possibility is there, and that's worth exploring. You know, I like building stuff, and so I want to be really clear about that. Right? Uh, and as, as someone asked before, like, wait, wait. <laughs> like, I've only showed you a single component. There's actually multiple components here, multipath, especially for stuff in the 2.4 gigahertz band, which is such a terrible spectrum. So how do you do that? Um, so at least in the current design, the sky and recent paper, we tend to do all the multipath stuff in the digital domain. We have multiple taps. but you know, that might not be enough. Maybe you need multiple cancellation circuits if you want to put your device right next to a wall. Um, good question. And then if you have multiple cancellation circuits, how do you tune them? Right. Is it that you tune one, then tune the second? Good question. 
So what does that mean in the end? Like, where do I think this might be successful? Um, so clearly, there are places where capacity is ultra scarce, and MIMO isn't necessarily a feasible answer. This is true on things like wireless backhaul, where you, wanna, you can't really quite get the separation between the antennas. You have point-to-point -point links. Um, so clearly, if you have a really wide band you might be operating in, which then you're f frequency hopping across, this is going to be hard. Um, not necessarily because of the phase offset can handle that with the signal inversion, but rather just because of the frequency selectivity of the underlying RF components. Right? You're not going to like. Maybe there are balins that are can are flat across 100 megahertz, but right now uh, they're pretty expensive and not feasible. Um, is it that we're going to do this for protocols you could just drop in an enhancement, like for Wi-Fi? Let's drop in wi full duplex Wi-Fi APs. The clients don't have to be full duplex, yet you'll still be able to prevent hidden terminals. You won't double your capacity. You won't get channel fairness, but you can prevent hidden terminals. Um, so this gets back to this question about mobility. When the channel coherence time is smaller than the packet time, all bets are off, right? Because we can't tune the circuit. Um, so, un, you know, this isn't going to work in your ultra-fast changing environments, but uh, while that's important, there are lots of wireless environments that aren't like that. But really, I mean, I can present guesses, but they are just guesses. You know, as I said, nobody expected lasers are going to be used to read music, but that turns out to have been an amazingly useful use of them. So, so in summary, We've done something we thought was impossible, built full duplex radios. Um, it turns out we've got current ones that can, just about do, that can do Wi-Fi. So you know, 200 milliwatts, 20 megahertz. Talk a little bit about what the implications of that might be. But again, these are just uh, some guesses of mine. And I talked about what at least I think are the major, what are the possible hurdles we're going to hit, which might say, hey, in practice, this just isn't feasible. I mean, theoretically, it's possible. Right? We can do it. Whether we want to do it is a wholly separate question. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Additional like, power draw from doing this, like the power consumption of the actual radio. Uh, right. I can, yeah, yeah your, your, pri your prior or I could see when you have the two antennas, but now with this. Uh, well, so what's important is, don't forget the bail-in, right? We're basically getting a plus t and a minus t, and the assumption is that the input is 2t. So the transmit, to transmit at a power of x, the tx front end has to be putting out 2x. Um, so in that way, there, is, there can be a power cost. Um, but one thing is that you don't necessarily have to put the tap for the top bail-in in the center. It might be possible with differential powers. Like, oh, we put most of the power on the positive side, a little less power at the negative side, and then can we adjust the phase? Or the adjust, we have to adjust the amplitude less because there is this attenuation over space. But yeah, right now, yeah, you have to actually have the TX front end double the power. Yeah. I was wondering whether it's actually the way to add the cancellation that you're getting from, you say there's three ways of doing cancellation in digital, then there's the over the air because the antenna placement. But, uh, is it the amount of cancellation you get at the front end before you hit the most sensitive part of the radio, the most important? Because any digital cancellation is happening very at the end of the chain. Uh, if, if you don't give, if you have an interferer uh, hitting the front end of your radio, your signal is going to be corrupted before it even reaches the the digital baseband. So, I think the I mean. It, well, it's, it's, I think, so the question, I, I, don't, I don't think I quite understood the question, but maybe it's that, hey, isn't it that the more you can do before you hit the ADC, the better? Uh, much before. Actually, yeah. before you reach the front end of the radio, that <coughs> you need more cancellation there. So, uh, I, I mean, just adding up the numbers, like 30 plus 25, is that, is that a, a fair addition? I mean... So you're worried about that, is it that some of my, the cancellation circuits are essentially distorting the signal? Uh, no, I, I'm worried that the cancellation that you're doing at the, <coughs> in the digital will have less impact than the cancellation that you do at the front end. Uh, uh, not necessarily. I mean, it's just, no. Um, ultimately, you're constrained in the digital side by the precision of your ADC, right, by how many bits you have. So there's just a cap. You can't do better than that in the digital domain, because otherwise you just hear nothing, right? Um, and so then more, so if you want to do better than that, you have to do more earlier and earlier in the chain. But actually, 
you know, if I could, I would do everything in digital because it's so much more flexible, so much more. If I could have, you know, a 60-bit ADC, like, and just do it, absolutely, but you can't. Um, digital is programmable. I mean, just you can do anything. It's software, um, but in practice, that's not that's not possible. It's just too bad. I think at the end of the day, though, this whole thing rests on being able to tune <coughs> that past. I mean, this is the, the key thing. That, I mean, people have proposed this, this before. I have to tell you, in coexisting radios for in integrated circuits, and there's been many publications in, in IC form of the scheme. And it really boils down to how well can you match those two paths. That's the key issue. What, what exactly is the algorithm? How do you make that happen? And so as you rightfully pointed out initially, the dynamic range of the ADC is, is sort of a key thing there, right? So you're probably going to want to do the calibration of it in the digital domain that adjusts the phase, which requires a huge amount of dynamic range of the ADC. <coughs> then you said you had a method using an RSSI uh, chain, which replaced the dynamic range of the power consumption of that RSSI. It's the same thing. You know, it's going to be the same thing as the A to D. You're going to require just as much dynamic range but our RSSI readings have, I mean, this tremendous dynamic range, right? Like, you can at the expense of power. Can, so can ADCs. They can have enormous. You can have a, uh, a so 90, it's plus, 90, 90, plus, 90 plus dB dynamic range ADC, right? It's just at the, at the expense of power. I don't understand. So, but part of this has to do with the, the AGC, right? So I have, like, I have a Wi-Fi chipset today, right? The range of RSSIs that it can read is much greater than the range of digital samples which it can decode at any time because it's doing AGC to bring what is that RSSI then to a range which the ADC can accept, right? I mean, like, if you're saying the power is the same, then, that why, don't, then why don't my Wi-Fi chipsets or radio chipsets today, why can't they have digital samples across, you know, 80 dB? Because I'm doing AGC on the, sing on the signal, right? But you're absolutely, it all comes down to that, the attenuator and delay. It all comes down to how well we can do that, how precisely, absolutely right. Um, yeah, I think that's the key. It is, I know, it is the key, absolutely. So, right. Okay. Yeah, so. Okay. David. Um, so just a, one last question, just to ask what's next. You've shown you know, some potential here, and uh, you want to drive it forward. What's the bit of this you want to work on next? Oh, but so, uh, you know, full disclosure, right? So uh, Sachin Kadi, who's uh, the other faculty member at Stanford advising the students on this, and I and the two of the three students are doing a startup to try and make this stuff real. We'll see if that happens. Um, but from a research standpoint, um, for me, it's... Look, our link layer is really relates to things like link layer design. Our link layers have just completely assumed half duplex. If we have full duplex, would we design our link layer differently? There are things like as I'm sending a signal to a receiver, it can be giving me like real time, not delayed by a packet, information about what samples it's seeing and the quality of the channel. Can I adapt then dynamically in real time? Do I want to do things like interleave control information in my data packets? because I want to be giving that control feedback while sending it data simultaneously. Um, what would a full duplex link layer just saying, oh, we'll make Wi-Fi full duplex, doesn't seem like it's probably pushing the limits of what's possible. Maybe other things are possible. Um, but again, you know, I just, I just give talks. I'm sure students will come up with great ideas. So, Great. Well, thanks, Phil. Let's thank Phil.